morning. Um, I want to talk today about a really big topic, and this is probably one of the scariest videos <laughs> I've ever done. Um, but it also is very personal. So I'm going to talk about how the belief in hell creates cognitive dissonance. So first of all, I want to read you the definition of cognitive dissonance, okay? So cognitive dissonance um, is the mental discomfort or psychological stress experienced by a person who simultaneously holds two or more contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values. So if you think about two opposing beliefs, you can't get much more radical <laughs> than the belief in a God who is unconditionally loving and that that same God would send people to hell for eternal punishment. Um, so it's, it's pretty hard to, to wrap your head around how those could both be true. And it only stands to reason that that would create some psychological stress or discomfort, you know. Um, and we often see this in children. They really struggle with this idea of hell, and it hurts their heart to believe that God could, could do this to people. I mean, if a person did that, then we would definitely judge them as very vindictive, cruel. And yet we teach our children that God is all loving and yet would punish people for eternity. It's a very disturbing concept and it should hurt their hearts, okay? Because that's their conscience, their tenderness saying, this is not right. And yet we teach them um, over time to accept this and we basically inadvertently teach them to suppress their own compassion and their own love for others by teaching them that and, and getting them to accept this concept. And I think that violation of their own conscience and compassion and their own heart is a huge travesty. Um, so, but you know, as they turn into, you know, older children, young adults, adults, we eventually come to accept this concept, but the way that we can live with that is by compartmentalizing those two ideas, okay? Um, now, people may speak of the two in the same breath very calmly as if it's just a matter of fact, but the truth is to emotionally engage both of those ideas simultaneously, if we really emotionally engage the ramifications of a God that would do that, it causes emotional discomfort and psychological stress and cognitive dissonance. So the only way that we can do that is to essentially like wall them off, separate them and, and you know, contain them emotionally in separate containers so that they never really have to come in contact with each other. Now, I'm, you know, like I said, people may speak of it very calmly because they've mastered this compartmentalization so well that they're no longer emotionally affected by it. But that says something to our lack of humanity if we wouldn't be emotionally affected by this idea. You know, and, and I know all the rationalizations. God's ways are higher than our ways. Um, God can't be in the presence of sin. It's not for us to understand. I was in the church. I was raised in it. I get all of those rationalizations, but those are mind rationalizations. Those aren't speaking to the heart of what we feel and know is true in the deeper part of ourselves. So once we've kind of set the groundwork and, and we've learned to master this level of compartmentalization, so that we can live with ourselves and live with this idea, it kind of lays the groundwork for any other, you know, any other type of um, opposites like that. It's e it becomes easier to rationalize after that, you know, as long as we're told that it's okay. And this is the same thing. Our preachers, our teachers, our parents tell us that this is true and that it's okay. And so we accept that. Um, you know, another example of, of this, the way this compartmentalization can show up is that we teach people and accept that killing is wrong, but unless it's in the case of war, you know, and if you're defending your flag and your country, well, now killing is okay. <laughs> um, so, but our heart doesn't feel like it's okay. And guys coming back from war with PTSD, they can't reconcile that inside of their heart and mind. 
because we know inherently it's not okay just because somebody else told us it's okay just because they you know declared war for whatever their motivations are and they've rationalized doing this doesn't mean that our heart says it's okay and it creates big breakdown in the mind and the heart um, another example is people who rationalize maybe attacking people outside of an abortion clinic you know obviously that's not loving um, but they can justify it because they're saying what they're fighting against is worse and more important than the badness of wrongness of what our actions they're taking. Now, hold on a second. I'm not saying everybody who believes in hell is going off to war or is standing outside of abortion clinics. Those are just two examples of how once we master that compartmentalization, it makes it easier to have very opposite types of beliefs, views, actions, behaviors, and to justify them. Um, another example of just this, how we create these conflicting parts can be inside of us is sometimes we will suppress things that we're taught are wrong, but it's a genuine innate desire or need inside of us. You know, I'm thinking right now of, say, a preacher who preaches so strongly against homosexuality and then he's caught in a homosexual relationship because there's a part of him that genuinely desires this, but because he has so much judgment, he's been taught so much judgment, he tries to suppress and compartmentalize that part of himself. And it will only be suppressed for so long. And when nobody's looking or when it can't be suppressed any longer, it will come out to get its needs met. So, you know, finally, my last, you know, one thing I wanna say about this is that the belief in hell um, is at absolutely in opposition to any belief in oneness. How can it not be? We've got believer, non-believer. We've got forgiven, unforgiven. We've got acceptable, unacceptable. And this belief that you're going to be either, you know, in the acceptable, you know, the believers or the ones who are going to hell for eternity there's no room for the concept of oneness and that belief. That is locking yourself into duality. Um, and think of, you know, a really simple way to think about it, the heart, you have one heart, the heart speaks into oneness and feels into oneness. You have two sides of your brain <laughs> and they're constantly creating that duality, that struggle, that conflict. And your heart always knows what's true, but the brain can be convinced of anything. Through conditioning, you, we learn through repetition, we're told these things over and over again. It's similar to, you know, brainwashing, right? And I'm not saying, well, everything that people teach their kids is bad and wrong, of course not, that's ridiculous. But we still, we learn through repetition, we learn through what we're taught, whether it's right or wrong. I mean, think about it, you, you know, you're born into a Muslim family, that is true and right for you. You're born into a Mormon family, that is right and true for you. You're born into a Christian family, that is right and true for you. And if somebody challenges it, you actually feel guilty or you, you know, you feel fearful and you think that that's your conscience, but it's really a conditioned response. We can teach children to be afraid of anything or to believe anything because they don't have the critical factor filter that's preventing ideas from getting into their subconscious mind. Once those ideas are in their subconscious mind, that becomes our guidepost. We think that that's the ultimate truth that we judge everything by, but the brain, the mind, is a limited form of truth. The heart connects to higher wisdom. The heart connects to Christ consciousness. It connects to our higher self. It connects to all of the information that's available and it will not guide you wrong. Now, it can be confusing when you have all these other beliefs and other conditioning and fears and stuff from our childhood to discern which is which, but the more you clear that stuff out, then the easier it is to really know what's your true inner guidance and wisdom. So anything that doesn't speak into love, anything that doesn't speak into oneness, anything that doesn't speak into equality, it cannot be true, it cannot be of, of God. You know? And, um, you know, I could go on, I'm not gonna try to stick to this one topic, um, but I just hope that this will open your eyes to the fact that just because somebody taught you that, and even 
if the Bible says that, we don't necessarily know um, if everything people said Jesus said that he said. I mean, it was it's none of those accounts were written until 60 years after he passed away. And we've all heard the telephone game and how you start off saying something to one person and they say to the next person, the next person. It changes a lot. 60 years, people could definitely add their own beliefs, their own interpretation to things that they say Jesus said. So trust your heart. And if your conscience says that you couldn't do it and it would be wrong, it would feel wrong, then trust that. Don't trust the words of other men over your own heart, your own conscience, your own inner guidance. Um, and we can start to begin to create oneness within ourselves and oneness among mankind. So I hope this was useful. I love all of you very much. I really do want all of us to come together as one and let go of judgment and have true healing so that we can have transformation and do the job of creating heaven here on earth.